good evening and welcome to episode 21. We get the keys to the door now. Well, what door it is, we don't know. Of Hocus Focus, I'm Thomas Sheridan. And I'm Sarah Mongaini. And this week we're going to try something a bit different. But before we get to that, how are you doing, Sarah, this week? Yeah, I'm all good. Um, I'm quite taken aback, actually, by the overwhelming response to last week's show. Uh, the live chat and the comments were lit up all through the episode. That was amazing to see. So... Thank you, everybody, for that, and I'm really glad you enjoyed it. Um, the weather's been great here. I've been enjoying that and working outside. We watched. Um, I've been well. We've watched our chosen film, Day of the Triffids, and I've also been working on some more new ideas for my channel as well as our side projects as well. So I've been quite busy yourself. Yes, and I just want to say thanks to Gary Michael Bassi Facey for uh, his report from. The Czech Republic. It was brilliant. And uh, again, if you want to send in a location report, please do. And also check out Gary's work, uh, look at his books, uh, subscribe to his YouTube and, you know, give him some love for making that excellent film. Yeah, we hope to get him back on for another episode soon as well. So if you're listening, Gary, get in touch. So tonight we're going to do a little thing a little bit different tonight. Instead of having our usual three subjects, we thought we would have a what we call a paranormal jam session or a Fortean jam. I like paranormal jam better. And the thing is, we're going to have a free form open discussion that can go anywhere. It can go into the world of fun, Fortean ontology, paranormal, spookiness, whatever. Now, I want to kick this off by talking about something that's been kind of bugging me for a bit now. And that is why the mainstream media has suddenly become all very cozy and comfortable and endorsing of the whole UFO, you know, unidentified flying object, aerial phenomena thing, strange lights. Since, and I can even tell you when it happened, it happened, interestingly, not long after Anuma Uma happened. And there was a sighting by, I think, a British Airways jet and a Virgin Atlantic jet over the west coast of Ireland of these, these strange craft. And it got very heavy coverage on the mainstream media in America. I remember even Tucker Carlson did a, a special on it. And from that point on, including all the naval footage of these things flying, these lights flying around, were being introduced into a cozy way into the world of hey, the aliens are here maybe they're here maybe they're already here and i'm extremely suspicious about it for loads of reasons one the sudden way it turned on a dime from people saying they saw aliens you know i always remember that jeff Fo foxworthy joke you know you're a redneck when more memories of your family have been abducted by aliens and have college degrees, now it's turned on a dime. The ridicule has all stopped. And suddenly the most obnoxious people I know who would have laughed at anyone and said aliens and laugh, laugh out loud are going, well, you know, the U.S. Navy is, you know, they, they now accept they exist, you know, and this kind of thing. And it reminds me very much, much of the Rona kind of programming of the last few years in that they get these uh, people who think they're oh so clever to believe what they want them to believe. And now they have them believing in this alien thing. Now, of course, this brings up the subject of Project Bluebeam. One of the conspiracy theories going back years I've often felt was very, very plausible. Either they would have an event in the sky using holograms, either a fake alien invasion or either a god appearing in the sky, Jesus, in order to control the masses. And there is a precedence for this. In 1960, I think it was, the CIA tried to project the gigantic image of the Virgin Mary above Cuba, above Havana from a submarine, in order to get the Cubans to turn against communism and return back to being a democracy. Well, it wasn't a democracy, but what the Americans wanted. And so there is a precedent there, and it can be done. The technology exists, uh, but it's a risk. It's an extremely risky one for them. They li literally have to be at their last... Uh, dice before they pull that one out that card out the deck but i want to know why we're being suddenly given permission to believe in all this stuff 
and and I don't believe there's anything good about her. What do you think, Sarah? I'm wondering, are the governments at the last dice, like you say, are these um, people that are ruling the, the world playing their last card? Because the public, most of the public have seen through the scamdemic. Um, and again, the post office is reporting the highest um, record numbers of people using cash. So the digital um, cash agenda doesn't seem to be working. Um, the huge protests about the 15-minute cities and the ongoing investigations into the 5G and and the list goes on. So maybe they're thinking, well, let's just throw our Trump card in and, and see how we go, see, see what happens. And the people, a lot of people on the flip side of that are also still very brainwashed from the scamdemic and still very afraid um, and still believe everything that they read and see and hear on the TV. So p those people, their nervous systems are still quite heightened and still um, being manipulated to the brainwashing. So it's the perfect time to test the waters with it just to see if it's worth running it now or not. I went back and looked at some old videos of like the golden age of Fortean and Paranormal you know, TV shows like Arthur C. Clarke and stuff. And what's very interesting is that I didn't find one outside TV news reports that kind of ridiculed the people who were seeing it. In fact, no matter what country it was in, there seemed to be an element of compassion towards these people. Like, they, they you know, the, maybe the producers or the camera people went down there to think that they were idiots and then suddenly found that they were nothing but the sort. They were telling the truth. So there was a, a what comes across in so many of the reports is a is a, a beautiful honesty in these people who've had these these experiences them, and an inability of the mainstream in terms of actual reports to be able to put them down. Now, but then when it comes to say a random comment somewhere or something like that, then all the kind of little green men thing starts out, all the jokes begin, all the, the you know, the things of like, these are only rednecks uh, see them and they can't get a decent photograph of them and so on. And I think that was part of the PSYOP as well for one reason, and it's the same reason that still exists now. I don't think they have a clue what these things are. I don't think these, these strange lights or these strange things that appear in the sky I don't think the CIA, the militaries, any of them have the faintest clue what's, what they are or what they're about. And they spent years sort of being in denial of them to the point now where they're saying, well, maybe we can actually use them as the legitimate. You know, so just, you never notice that they always show the ones like the Navy one. It was flying at incredible speeds and made a right hand turn, which has been reported for decades. But now they they openly report it. It's almost like they're saying, well, this thing is now useful to us. So where, say, a certain virus could be a kind of a bioweapon, now they have a mind weapon. Now they have a mind weapon, and they can use the legitimacy of these real reports as the foundation for launching their own fake ones. I agree with that, and I also think that the, the people who've experienced abductions and... Um phenomena there who used to be laughed at in the past I think they need to be very careful because they now are in a position where they could be taken advantage of so okay they may not be being laughed at and they're being taken serious by the mainstream media but it's for another agenda it's not because they care that they've been through this horrific experience it's because they want to use it to push another lie through on top of somebody's traumatic experience. And um, although it might seem on the face of it that they're getting a voice and they're being listened to and they're being understood about what they've been going through, at the root of it, they're really being ridiculed. They're still being ridiculed and used for it. And let's not forget the intelligence service, services and their interest in UFO cults and probably creating them. I, if you read the uh, Messages of Deception by Jacques Vallée, he basically started off, he's the, the scientist that they, they show the French guy in Close Encounters is based upon him. And 
he started off doing, you know, seeing all the anomalies and started looking for himself. And it led him eventually to cults. And he spotted earlier on that the Marshall Applewaite, the guy from the Heaven's Gate cult, back in the 60s, he was reporting the most bizarre things. You know, we, we hear now about the most educated people that he's most gullible. Well, he was he would interview, he would, he wrote in this book about going to see Marshall Lepperweight and his partner, who was a woman who died of cancer, uh, before the the, the, the 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 big event where they all committed suicide. And he he was in a in a room full of scientists uh in I think it was it was in some Stanford University, some Ivy League university in, in California. And he the guy was sitting on a stage talking about the alien spaceships are up there and blah blah blah. And a new world is coming. And he said he thought he'd expected people to ridicule and laugh at him. But when the thing was over, he got a standing ovation and loads of people with PhDs and masters went up and signed up for his Heaven's Gate group. Now, by the time they all committed suicide, there was very few of them left, you know, a few dozen or so on. Uh, But they and how he played, it was very interesting. And this ties into loads of things. His when he approached somebody and says, "Try to tell him about Heaven's Gate," he'd say, "Well, do you like Star Trek? Do you like Doctor Who? Do you like Star Wars?" And he goes, "Yeah, yeah. Well, you're already halfway there. You're already halfway there. It's only your brainwashing and education that makes you believe the full, not disbelieve the full story. You know, it's like they they read a Bible to you as a theory, but then they say to you, well, God doesn't exist.' When he says that was what science fiction is like, and it's amazing how many people he captured with this." And the, the the proliferation of cults in the south of France is very, very upsetting, actually. Uh, these The French Secret Service was basically bringing people to France and putting them into big houses and encouraging them to form like alien contactee kind of cults. And all, and all of them are doomed end times, you know, with this kind of charismatic leader, which generally they're not charismatic, but they're, they're called that, who basically was the... Co- you know the go between between the space brothers, whatever they were, and 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 the and the cult, and things like channeling was a big deal. And now these people were never investigated by the police or anything. And even when family members said, like, we're being, you know, my wife is is been, and the, and the kids have moved into this bunch of people who get messages from the space brothers, and I'm worried. They, they were it was they were left alone they were left alone to see how it developed and uh, it often developed very badly for these people and there was also one group in um in America and there was a book written about them called my life in orange and they used to wear an orange tr- jumpsuits ready to be taken by the space brothers at any minute and they were told that at midnight on a certain date the spaceship would land out beside their building and bring them all to the mother planet and at, at midnight, the spaceship never arrived. And so they decided after looking at each other in shock that the clock that they were using was the wrong time. And the clock in the other room that was five minutes slow was the real time. And so they all ran into the uh, the other room. And these people are all PhDs, master degrees, everything like that. And then the other clock struck midnight and the alien spaceship didn't arrive. And then after a brief pause, the leader of the cult said, We've been chosen to remain here on Earth to continue our work. And they're all happy. Now, so much of that reminds me of the Rona thing, doesn't it? Of the, you know, how one mask is enough, then it wasn't enough. Then you could do this, then this wouldn't work, and that wouldn't work. Oh, no, now it does work. And I think that that, that a lot of that stuff that was unleashed in the last three years was developed out of these research programs into, into flying saucer cults. And now they're coming full circle. Now they're going to bring in the actual real flying saucer cult. And it's going to be to the situation where the normies are going to be laughing at us saying, I don't believe it. You know, and that, that, that there, there's a turn up, there's a turn up for the books for you. You mean now you're the, the tinfoil hat for not believing it? Exactly, yeah. There's a danger here for those people that have experienced um, abduction. And that kind of phenomena. These two, the two, I believe, these two types of those people. You've got the the 
the critical thinking ones who know that something's happened to them and they're not very vocal about it because it's quite a traumatic and it's a very personal experience. So they don't go around shouting it from the rooftops. They keep it within the family. Do you know what I mean? And then you've got the other kind who um, every time they see a flashing light in the sky, they've had an experience and they shout it from the rooftops and they post about it on the social media. And um, like you say, they're they're perfect um, specimens for going into these UFO cults. And for those who have genuine, terrifying experiences, there's a danger that they might be gaslighted into feeling that somebody cares. So please come forward, come forward and tell us and tell us your experience. We want to know we can help. Um, And I just think it's going to be another case in some cases of wheeling out the bewildered, just like they do on the reality TV shows, you know, like um, uh, Britain's Got Talent and Pop Idol and that, where the bewildered are wheeled out in front of an audience for 15 minutes of fame. But really, they're being taken advantage of and it's a circus. My advice really would be if you're having those kinds of experiences at the moment, especially now with what we know is uh, and somebody asks you or approaches you and says, come forward because we're very interested and we can help. I would not go public. I wouldn't go public with it because it's not for the good of, of, of your health. It's to push an agenda. And God only knows if you were having a real experience, what they'd do to you. You know, you might, find, you might find yourself the next MK Ultra or something. Well, that crossed my mind. Do you remember the child line um, with Esther Ransom when they did child line? I don't know if they did it in Ireland, but here in the UK, we had a child line um, with a phone number they gave out in the 80s so that if anybody was being abused, any children were being abused, they could phone this number in confidence um, and they'd be put on to a Samaritan who could give them advice. And it turned out um, a lot of the BBC names that were to do with the um, procuring of children were running it and they they believed it was um, a face, a fascia to try and filter out the high profile ones. So all the ones who phoned up and said, yeah, I've, I've been abused and it was... Um, a high profile case they could f- filter those out and silence the children so it's almost like if um coming forward with your ufo experiences is that a way of filtering out the real ones um and silencing them and yeah. just letting the bewildered go forward you mean to tell me if someone called up and says jimmy savile or cyril smith molested me I- yes because, yeah it would filter filter out the high profile ones yeah Wow, that is the, one of the darkest, most evil things I've ever heard. If you if you want to have a look at it, if you've not heard about that, it was called Childline, and Esther Ranson was the patron for it. And she's a sinister individual too, tied up with Sowell and all that. Yes, so there was some real dubious names behind it, and it was believed to be a front um, for what was going on over at the BBC for the, for those networks, one to filter out the high profile cases and shut them up. So those, those could, those children could disappear. And two, um, it was a way to prey and feed upon everyday kids that were phoning up who'd been abused, you know, because you get information about where, where they're phoning from, where they are. So it was a very, very sinister organisation. I don't think it's running now, but it was very, very big in the 80s. And then you had the kids ringing up just saying it because they couldn't go out that night or because they they, they were told, no, they couldn't do this, they couldn't do that. So they were they were phoning it just to report the parents just because they were <laughs> because they were spoiled. So it didn't work for that reason either, but it was a big front. And there's, there's no reason why that couldn't happen again with people who are experiencing abduction phenomena. So you hear that if you get, if you do have the, if these experiences, just shut up, say, just keep it to yourself or your friends. Don't, don't go public about it. Don't, no, appro- also, don't approach authorities. All the newspapers. Yeah. Um, I, would, I would just keep it with your family and close friends or if there's other people that you know 
are going through the same experience, but I will certainly would not go public with it because what what they're going to do? What can they do anyway? They can't help you. Now, bringing it back to you, just remind me then what you said. Bringing it back to that Jack Foxworthy joke about you know rednecks only see and trailer trash only see aliens and spaceships. Uh, I that's something that fascinates me is why people from working class backgrounds, whether they live on council estates or whether they live what they call in America trailer trailer parks and all this, are more likely to have these experiences and paranormal experiences in general. This is something, and we, you know, we don't have to do not have to stick with UFOs for this bit. But this, you know, you look at the Enfield poster, guys. You look at the there's so many things. They're, they're, they they tend to be based on poor people. Now, there's two ways of looking at this. The poor people are more receptive to it. Maybe for I don't know. Maybe they're they're open to it more, or maybe it, the middle class do have these experiences and they shut up about it. They don't talk about it. But uh, I find that very interesting. That you know, you could always say like, "Well, they were down." Like even that the Chicago Mothman thing that we were covered about not too long ago, that was all taking place in like the, the poorest parts of Chicago. Now, now, what's that about? Do you have any theories on that, like the on the demographic of communities and stuff like that? I think um, with the middle class, they they don't have the same kind of anxieties and worries that the working class people have so they they don't create the same kind of psychic hotspots within a small area within a, an urban town and um, maybe those middle class people that live in remote villages down in the countryside they experience a different kind of phenomena out there in the hinterlands but they don't they don't see it because they're not attuned to it because they're too busy um doing what middle class people do which is enjoying the money really isn't it and yeah now that's probably a good point to point out now that sarah and i are talking about the british irish version of the working class middle class that's quite different than american where a lot of people who are middle class in america are actually really working class they just call themselves middle class but the world that we grew up in the gulf between a working class person living on what we call a council estate and a middle class person who lived in the nice suburbs was a colossal economic, social, and everywhere we were growing up. And it was a very, very it was it was a huge gulf between the two, massive. And you know, they, these people, although they weren't even super rich or anything, they just seemed so far away from where we were. And what you said about the the, the different anxiety levels they have, I think I, I think the social issues that you get in the poor areas, like the Ken Loach films, the the, the the Kitchen Sink dramas. There's something about that world that opens the door. I can't, I can't explain it. I don't, I'm not sure why. Uh, but there's something... The psychic firewall is lessened. And it, it's easier for these things, both good and bad, to get through. Well, some towns, especially mill towns, and I don't know how you would describe a mill town... Um, to the American audience, really, what, what uh, you, you, you would have to, you definitely would. You have these towns, industrial towns, they'd be like all over America, very similar to the ones you're talking about. Places like, you know, they're all around the, all over northern New Jersey, northern Massachusetts, on the, there's loads of them, Pennsylvania, like in the whole like anthracite region, places like Wilkes Bar, Barry, uh, Scranton, all these places would be very, very similar to the ones that you're talking about in England. Well, where I come from, um, I come from Manchester, which is a huge city, which was based on the cotton mills. And um, we're surrounded by hinterlands and various small mill towns, which literally um, enclose the city. And some towns, some especially mill towns, might have faced um, economic decline or have struggles with social issues, which can lead to a sense of neglect and that, that kind of environment can give um, rise to alternative subcultures 
and um, counterculture movements and unconventional lifestyles that can give the town a reputation as being non-conformist and seeking escape from the mainstream society. And it can create lots of little psychic hotspots there because um, in the mill towns, before they were mill towns, they were where I live. Certainly they were rural farmsteads, which had their own folklore and ghostly stories. Um, we talked about one last week with the bar guest of Godly Green, where I live. And then as we went into the Industrial Revolution, those farmsteads were knocked down and the mill towns came and the people that lived on the farmsteads and the following generations then were thrust into life inside a factory instead of life on the farm. And I think that could be quite quite traumatic as you get used to that. Now you're in a cage and you're working in a steamy factory for um, a few quid a week, Monday to Friday, Monday to Saturday. And the only thing you've got to look forward to is the end of the week and spending your wages and worrying about how you're going to pay the bills and how you're going to pay um, the rent. And have you got enough money to feed your family? And I think that brings with it a whole load of family issues maybe that you don't see behind closed doors. So things go on behind closed doors that these anxieties bring and that creates um, like a hotspot or a pocket for, say, poltergeist activity to come in or um, it can attract all kinds of supernatural entities. And then if... Um, like you say, with council estates and um, is it, what are they called? Is it the projects in America? Yeah. In, and, uh, and on the projects. There are more high rise, those kind of places, but yeah. Yeah, so you get a poltergeist activity going on there. And obviously that then makes the family afraid and nervous, which then makes them more anxious. And then that anxiety then feeds the poltergeist activity, which then feeds them with more fear and anxiety, and that makes the poltergeist activity stronger. So it kind of feeds itself, I think. And then as the years go on and these council estates and places get knocked down for future development, there's another layer then on the landscape. And we build up, we knock it down and we build over it and we put the nice new modern houses and the nice new modern flats and apartments on there. But it doesn't really get rid of the history of what's gone on on that land over the years. So from the farmsteads to the cotton mills to the council estates to the new um, trendy high, high rises and apartment blocks that are there now it's a layer upon layer upon layer of of psychic activity which never goes away and it's never dispersed and I think it just builds up and it builds up and it builds up and I don't think you have that in the um upper middle class areas no because they'll have the the neighborhood developed around a golf course or something like that or on the seafront or somewhere more sort of uh aesthetically pleasing rather than you know somewhere gritty and nasty or somewhere that was very poor farm farmland uh, there was a, a place where my brother lives I lived up there for a while there's a town in West Dublin called Talla and there was a place called Killinarden Heights and literally in the middle of the housing it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, what you know it's, it is council state it's poor people working class people and it's on the side of the mountains and the paranormal activity in that strip, that street, those streets were off the scale when the houses were first moved into the early 80s. And the whole area is surrounded with megaliths. And there's even one megalith in the middle of the green of the housing estate. It's buried now, but it's, 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 it's in a roundabout. It's not a famous one. And there's things like that. And I'm convinced that they actually affected the you know, the fairy kind of things. But the, the stories were horrifying to people had massive poltergeist activity. People seen dark shadow people all around them. Now, a good American example of this would, of course, be Point Pleasant in West Virginia, the, the home of the Mothman. That's, uh, 
that was a huge ammunition factory called the TNT area. And that factory produced all the huge amounts of munitions for World War II. But when, of course, when the war ended, there was nobody working there. And as soon as it's kind of an abandoned place, then you have the Mothman thing coming up. You know, they, a couple of people who would have been from this part of the world who brought their folk legends with them. And there's also the American, Native American Indian stuff that goes on in that. So even in America, it happens. And I'd be interested to know what happens in Australia and Canada. I'm sure it does in certain kind of places like that. But there's so, yeah, it's, 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 it, it, it the door is opened and then it's never shut, like you said, because the next layer builds upon that, builds upon that, builds upon that. So what you may have had, say, like an area where there was, I don't know, you know, a ghostly thing. Then you have a council estate built on that and all the social problems in that or a factory. All the horrors of working in those Victorian factories. That psychic energy is now trapped in a landscape. So it becomes the next layer of darkness. But just uh, that's a very powerful idea when you think of it. And what's the only way out of it? There was no way out of it. Just clear the land and plant a forest or something. That would, and even then, that would probably be a haunted forest. It's interesting, also, isn't it? And I've got a bit of an example. Go on. Sorry, Thomas. Go on. Go. On. Sorry, Tom. No, I, I just have a bit of an example, just to paint, paint a picture of what you're saying there. Um, I'll have to be careful how I word it, um, just to keep privacy, but. When I've mentioned to you before, when I was uh, growing up, grew up in a flat that had a poltergeist, um, but it wasn't just our flat. It was the whole block of flats. Um, it was our flat, the one underneath and the one underneath that. It was a three story flat. And on the other side, they didn't seem to have any problems. But on our side of the building, it seemed to be there. Anyway, now that flat's still there and I've. I've just discovered that the, a person that lives in that flat has just been arrested for doing some very nefarious things. So um, I, I won't go into too much detail. But, um, yeah, he's been arrested. So I now I knew this person because he used to think I was barmy when I used to tell him about what used to go on in that flat because he never he told me he never noticed anything. He'd never had any problems there. Um and then a few months ago, we discovered he was up to something and the police turned up at his door and, and off he went. He got arrested and it was it was quite, was not very nice what he'd been doing. Um, and I wonder, okay, he says he didn't have any experience of anything paranormal or any poltergeist activity there, but he wasn't a very nice person and he was up to some very bad things. Did that house might not have shown itself as poltergeist activity. Did it have an effect on him? Was he like that? Did that flat attract him? Mm -hmm. Are we back to the Marson house in Salem's Lot? That a, an evil place attracts an evil man or an yeah. evil person. And now that flat's standing empty with its windows broken because he, um, the, local, um, the local people around here won't stand for the kind of thing he was doing. And his windows were put through, and uh, he's had to go. I can we can kind of think, I guess, what that was about. Yeah, I can kind of say it without saying it. Yes. So I wonder, is it a coincidence, or is that block of flats built on some kind of a psychic hotspot? That if you're a decent person or a decent family it, it shows itself as poltergeist activity and um a, a rather noisy ghost that would be a pain in the ass really for the people that lived in the block of flats and but if you're a person of um who's not very nice who's got those tendencies it doesn't show itself as poltergeist activity it, it manifests itself it, well it's you you're kind of the physical embodiment of it and that's why you're there. Is that it, why you moved in? It it feeds what's currently present. You know, that's that brings us back to the thing I was reminded of there of like if Ireland wasn't Christian, would the relationship with the sea the she be less hostile? It's the same kind of thing. If Ireland was did the pagans who lived before the Christians have a more ha you know, happier relationship with the she, you know, but now they're just responding to what's here now or what they used to be here. 
Because it's funny that they used to be seen to be at their most vicious when Ireland was its most Catholic. And that's very interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it sounds sounds like the she won't stand any nonsense. You know, they're not just going to pretend and and put up with it and 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 turn a blind eye to it. They don't want anything to do with it. So if you, they don't want anything to do with humans. And this week's folk horror cinema is the 1963 film Day of the Trip. It's a film that you watch now and in light of the last three years kind of takes on a new mind of its own. I recently discovered that this film was based, was not based on, but was the uh, inspiration for the 28 Days Later zombie movie, which I found was quite interesting. What we've had in the last three years is a combination of both of those things, or we're actually getting it. Now, Day of the Triffids was based on a novel, very loosely, I might add, uh, by John Wyndham, who was the British dystopian sci-fi writer of the 1950s. He also wrote The Midwich Cuckoos, which was a story about alien babies being born at the mothers, which later became the Damned films, Village of the Damned, These are the Damned, and so on. Wyndham's book is quite different in his typical dystopian sense. There's no real happy ending. Britain falls into a kind of a police state and uh, it isn't really resolved at the end. But in the film, because it was aimed at a Hollywood audience, there had to be a happy ending. But the 1963 version of the film, nonetheless, even though it, it's, it's fairly, it's, it's a good departure from the book, it's still a very, very good film. The film begins with a meteorite shower over, a meteor, a meteorite shower, a meteor shower over London. And most spectacular scene in history. And very well done, special effects, I might add, for 1963. It looked really good. And uh, the character played, the main character was an American seaman called Howard, played by the actor Howard Keel, is recovering from an eye operation at Central London Hospital. And he's an American seaman who's, you know, his absence from his ship was, you know, an accident had put him on into the hospital. And he's told not to oh, take the bandages off until the following morning. And he's annoyed because he's miss he's missing the meteor shower of the century. The following morning, it turns out when he does wake up and he hears the chimes of the clock ringing outside, that no one has come to take his bandages off. And he takes them off and finds the hospital in ruins and everyone missing. Except for the surgeon who had done the eye operation on him. And he's blind. And he figures out and he's told that the meteor shower has made everyone blind what's ever in it. Now, that's bad enough. What a horrible thing that is. Everyone's looking up at the meteor shower of the century and it causes permanent blind blindness in urines by destroying the optic nerves. The, the doctor throws himself out the window and it becomes quite dark. He wanders the streets of London and there's people walking around looking. It's very frightening and sad, actually, the part where he reaches the train station and people saying, could you get me a taxi to go see my wife? Now, everyone's blind. And then suddenly a train smashes into the, into the station and all the passengers come out. And one of them is a little girl who turns out has run away from boarding school, but she hid in the baggage car with no windows. So she missed the overnight uh, special meteor show. So she can see too. And you have people panicking and trying to kidnap them and stuff when they can see they can, and they realize they can see. Uh, but then they know something else is going on. There is a strange plant that seems to be appearing. And this, as on the previous night, had killed a security man at a botanical gardens in England. And it's a planet a tri called planet called the Triffid. And this, but what has happened is the meteorite has made it grow bigger and breed massively. And it can walk without having roots. So it's, it becomes a kind of a Lovecraftian horror at this point. Now, as they come to the realization that not only is everyone blind, uh, but they the whole countryside is starting to be covered in these very dangerous plants, they make their way towards Dover. He tries to stop go to his regular ship to pick up his crew, but his crew are all missing, presumably blind. And there's one terrifying segment in the film, typical John Wyndham's darkness, 
of an airliner coming from Cape Town and everybody on board is blind, including the captain, and they're running out of fuel. It's a very disturbing scene, actually. And so it's a very John Wyndham kind of dystopian scene. And so they realize they have to make their way to Paris then because Dover's in ruins, it's, it's, it's in flames. So they take a small boat across the English Channel and make their ways towards Paris. On the way, they end up in this, this basically this, this home uh, where they're looking after people. And some of them can see for some reason. And uh, they missed out on the meteorites as well. And this becomes a kind of a home for them. And there's a French girl there called Bettina, a very pretty French girl, who kind of adopts the little girl. And she's played by the English actress Carol Ann Ford, who was a Doctor Who legend later on, ironically. And uh, she's really pretty and beautiful, but she's really sweet. And then these bunch of a group of prisoners come along and take over the place and start getting drunk and everything. And this is very interesting because in the book, it was actually radical. It was actual radicals from a new form of government. They were like almost like anarchists, not anarchists like Marxists who were trying to take over. In the film, they made them prisoners and put them in France. And eventually they have to leave. And it's just a horror scene where everyone gets eaten in, in by the Triffids. At the same time, there's another story running about a couple inside a lighthouse who are going through marital difficulties because of his alcoholism. And then they're being attacked on the island. And they're kind of like the, the resolving of the issue. So as the guy travels from the south of France, he realizes it's in ruins there. So then they make their way down to Cadiz in Spain. And then they find that, that submarines have been un were under the water when the light show was happening. The crews are all fine. So they're making pickups in Cadiz and for Gibraltar to get people, to get anyone who can see in Europe and bring it into Gibraltar uh, to kind of like restart humanity again, I guess. In the book, it's the Isle of Wight, which I kind of find interesting when you think of uh, the Sandown Clown. But um, the it, it ends with a happy ending when they discover that Salian salt water actually kills the triffids which you think would be an easy would have been a forceful thing they thought of but that's an accident discovered discovery leads to this and they dissolve away and then they radio again presumably they radio from the lighthouse so here's how you kill them and then humanity begins again it's a happy kind of ending for the americans with the the, the mall walk of the church with the church bells ringing and then the world is saved that's not what happens in the book as if there's a real difference between british sci-fi and american sci-fi for you and um so anyway, that's the film. It's brilliant. It's really great. It's sad. But my God, and Sarah, I'm sure you agree with me when you get to your, your review of it. It has so many parallels of what we've dealt with in the last few years. The blindness could be seen as a metaphor by people unable to see the scandemic. Uh, the the Triffids are motor hydras, babies, and all this kind of thing. And uh, it's only, the, again, it's, it's there are people who who see it for what it is, but they're almost like a metaphor for their blind to propaganda rather than an eye operation or the or an innocent child who sees reality. The free thinkers, the little girls running away from home, the merchant seamen who's, you know, they, they're, they're people who, you know, they're, 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 they're not, they're mavericks in their own way. And that's what I got from the film, 1963, The Day of the Strippers. There's a BBC version. There's numerous radio play versions, but even with this version being so different than the book, I still really, really like the film. And it's aged very, very well. So that's my review of The Day of the Triffids. How did you like it, uh, Sarah? Yes, I enjoyed it. I remember watching it as a young girl as well. Um, and like you say, it, it begins with the massive meteor shower and it blinds the majority of the Earth's population. And then this chaos that ensues and uh, the unusual plant, uh, plant species known as the triffids. Now, I don't know about the film, but certainly in the book, the cultivation of those plants, surprise, surprise, was blamed on the Russians. Um, and they were capable of uprooting themselves and moving around. And they take advantage of this situation with the meteorites. Um, and the plants were, again, from the book, they were previously cultivated for their oil. But now they pose this severe threat to the human survival. And Bill Mason, played by Howard Keel, who was very handsome in that film, I have to say, um, he awakens in a hospital because um, he's had a, a problem. I don't remember what happened to what happened to his eye again, Thomas. 
if I if I remember if I remember on the book there was an explosion or a fire on the ship. Uh, right, so yes. And that's how he ended up in an English hospital. That's right, yeah, because he was desperate to get back to his ship. Yeah. So he's there all bandaged up with his eyes covered. Um and then eventually, like Thomas says, the morning after he wakes up and nobody comes to to take the bandages off. And it turns out now that he's one of the few remaining sighted individuals on the planet. And he embarks on a mission to rescue um, a love interest called Joe, played by Nicole Murray. And they have to navigate this world that's been plunged into darkness and blindness. And I, I enjoyed it. The film goes through a lot of themes of isolation and survival and the morality of human actions in desperate circumstances. And it highlights the fragility of civilization when it's faced with a sudden catastrophe and a breakdown of societal norms. And throughout the film, the BBC was in the backdrop all the time with the public service announcements. And I don't know if they were getting it wrong or covering it up, who knows? But they were telling you firstly that um, the meteorites were there to enjoy and it was a once in a lifetime display so go and watch it and enjoy it um, and then the next breath they're telling you to stay home and stay tuned to the radio so in other words don't think for yourself and do as you're told and I wondered too if it was a metaphor for a blind public listening and following the orders of the media of the time because all those who did who did as they were told, they ended up stuck or in trouble. And all those blinded were the ones who, um, and all those that were blinded were the ones who believed the official line of a meteor shower. And so they watched it because the radio told them to do so. And the visuals and the special effects in the film, they might seem dated by today's standards, but they do give the film the right amount of suspense and tension. And I thought that opening scene was really good with the different, you know, with the lights coming down from the sky and the different colours that were flashing. And it looked like London was under attack, really, by these lights that were coming down. And Howard Keels delivered a really good performance as the strong Bill Mason. And all the cast really gave good performances. And while the film might not be on the same level as the book, it is a really good sci-fi film and it stands the test of time and it's a good exploration of societal collapse and uh, the survival instinct kicking in. And I think it resonates with the audiences even now, decades after, well, especially now with what we've gone through. Absolutely. Uh, I, it's it's almost like that experience of the last three years is allowing us or telling us or informing us or even gifting us to look back at the these films that we, and these TV shows that we grew up with and say, oh, that's exactly what we're dealing with right now. And this is like ties in with the, the whole thing. Authors like Mary Ellen Guiley and others have put forward that the, the best sci-fi authors are actually like prophets or seers. They see the future and then they bring it backward in time and bring it forward and well forward in their time to them. And then when it comes to our time, we realize that what we're seeing is the experiences of the day happening in front of us. And you think about like the story that John Wyndham came up with in the fifties, it would be really out there by today's standards, even, you know, and also, you know, the midwich cuckoos as well, the women being come and suddenly become and find themselves impregnate, impregnated and this kind of thing in a town out of the blue. And that remind you know, reminded me so much of these, like I wrote us these false alien pregnancies back in the 1980s, Bud Hopkins was writing books about it and stuff. The the film The Day of the Triffids has a, another element in there in the danger of nature. We think we've conquered nature. We think that and this is very prevalent to an age we live in now where, where we're hearing this absolute nonsense that mankind is destroying the planet. The nature it will destroy us if it feels like it at any second. We're nothing. We have no power next to Gaia. And it does give that element and of na the power of nature something as simple as a plant that's carnivorous like a Venus flytrap and can grow and spread very quickly and grow to like eight or nine feet tall and eat people 
and is I find that is very a, a warning about our arrogance and hubris as this you know we are the we are we are the danger to the earth. No, it's the other way around. And even during the height of the the, the lockdown, I remember thinking. Is there something else really? Is there something going on? Is there an asteroid? Is there something? It, 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 it's a corporate story, and here we have this, this. We have this in the film, the meteor shower. Something so simple. If you had, and you saw what the meteors looked like when they were coming in in the movie, that you'd want to run out and see them and go, "Ooh, ah, wow!" The once in a lifetime thing. So you could tell people, and I saw the great meteor shower. You know, it's amazing, and and that that reminds me of how the media behaved during the beginning of the. The, the last three years that the everyone glued to the television having to watch it having to observe it and they becoming blind to reality by becoming spellbound by these this footage that showed nothing really someone falling in china or a bunch of trucks in milan yeah it's I, i'm convinced that people like john what with when when and our, and people like that when they wrote their books, they were getting prophecies from the future, and they were conveying an allegory in the classic sense. It reminded me uh, that the meteor shower reminded me of the pot banging because they were all getting excited and they were all outside watching it. Oh, look at that! Look, look, look! Isn't it amazing? Like they were all outside pot banging, you know? Like oh, we've all got our pots. Look at us! We were all a uh, part of the great. Um, Let's say, uh, um, help. What was it? The, what was the slogan for the heroes? It was something to do with the key workers, the NHS heroes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. The pots. I, I, I never did it. I used to shut the. It was in the middle. It was very hot. I remember the weather being very hot, and every Thursday night they'd be out there on our street, and I used to make a point of closing the windows very dramatically and loudly, <laughs> closing the curtains like. We didn't have it in Ireland, but I was impressed when it happened and it kicked off. And uh, it was it was surreal. It was surreal. We had people in Ireland saying things like, oh, I'm so jealous. Look what they're doing in England. We need to do that here. They were missing out on it. That's that. And and the, and the, the scene in Day of the Trip is at the train station and the absolute helplessness of everybody. It was exactly like where well, we just have to sit here and wait for instructions that kind of thing. And that was also common in that film when the wind blows as well, where, oh, don't worry, the Yanks will come and save us, but America's been destroyed by the Russians again. It's we've been live it's funny, you know, I've forgotten about that the Russians had biologically engineered that plant in the original book. We live it's like the Orwellian thing, isn't it? We've always been at war with Eurasia. You know, it's um it's like the perpetual enemy. It has always been there, you know, and, and that they've told it they've, in one way or another. It was the Cold War back then, but now it's a whole other thing now. It, 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 it's amazing. It's one of the best things about having kind of ontological eyes is that you you get to see the art and the films and everything you grew up with in a way that was, has resolved itself post scandemic that has added a whole new layer of experiential resonance to it. Isn't that, isn't that mad? But that's exactly what's happened. And probably those kinds of films are exactly what helped us get through the last three years intact without giving in, giving up and following the masses like they did in that movie. Oh, well, I always remember that from uh, the... The, the Tom Cruise version of War of the Worlds of the H.G. Wells book that everyone gathered together and my, and my attitude would be to like move in the countryside away from everyone else uh, yeah the, the, the message would be stay off the main like in Lord of the Rings stay off the main road because the, the you know the the Nazgul the ring rates were chasing them on horseback and Gandalf said stay off the roads and the same thing, stay off, stay off where everyone else is and you're safer. You know, and I, I found that, that scene where there, the ferry was attacked at the on the river in War of the Worlds terrifying. Uh, but they don't, they've made themselves targets. Uh, you know, that was the lesson in this, that like those of us who grew up watching these films and really understanding, you know, 
Tom Cruise only survived because he eventually figured out don't be with the main group, you know, and other films like that, like this as well, that they did. This is the reason why we're not sitting at home with waiting for the, the the suddenly and unexpected time bomb inside us. I remember um, back in 2012, before the Olympics of 2012, there was around the truther sites and the alternative media before the, the truth has got a little bit infected. There was a lot of story and a lot of um, rumour that the Project Bluebeam was upcoming for the um, either the opening or the closing ceremony of the Olympics. And I was working in Manchester City Centre at the time and I, I took quite a bit of an interest in that. And obviously it was playing on my mind. And I'm thinking, I was thinking to myself, you know, if this comes off, I'm going to be at work in the middle of this and I've got to get home from Manchester City Centre. So I was playing these scenarios out in my head about how I'd get home. And I actually went through in my head, you know, if it goes off and they do do this and I'm stuck in the middle of a busy city centre and I've got to get back home, I'm right off the main roads, right off the um, the main streets and the crowds. And I, and I had it all mapped out in my head how I was going to get home along the back roads, even though it, it, it didn't happen. But there was no way I would have followed the crowd even back then. Yeah, I've been like that too and things in my life as well using back streets and stuff to, to not follow the crowd. That thing with the 2012 Olympics, that, my friend, uh, my late friend, Enor Crane, was really big into that. And although nothing happened, it did happen, because remember that closing ceremony, how creepy that was, and they, they showed giant giant viruses, and then they had this like weird kind of children all dying in a hospital, dance mood number. And a baby being born, a new baby being born from a pool, a giant baby. And then you're, you're told to yourself, oh, it's just entertainment. It's a bit of art. Come on. That was, there was ever, the, a lot of things people have set up in mass rituals have not been mass rituals. Like the, the Gothard base tunnel thing, in, when they open that up and they say, oh, it's about the devil. It's not. It's, about, it's, actually, about, it's actually about a folk tale, a, sweet, a, sweet, a Swiss folk tale that happened there in a performance art. But the closing ceremony of 2012 was absolutely a ritual. I, it was the, what was to come right there. They even showed the guy who was the big leader of it all looking like Boris Johnson. It was it was all there. Yeah, it was very prophetic. And uh, when you look back on it now, you think, wow, even um, I'm sure there were some uh, things that looked like tentacles coming down there as well. I'm sure there was a giant octopus or something of, of tentacles, like Mother Hydra's babies were. Yeah, there was loads of things like that. Freeman Fry did a fantastic breakdown of it. And as even as soon as the whole lockdown started, he was the first one to jump on and really call it out. And yet, and he, even the stadium lit from above looked like the big the virus. You know, the pictures that they were showing everywhere. You know, the, the owner, a crown all this kind of thing in London and 2012 looking like Zion, which is like another kind of esoteric thing, you know? And then, but then that the hype up to that was all about project blue beam and something else. So we're all looking at the skies expecting something else. And right in front of our very eyes, we, we watched them tell us exactly what they were going to do and there's no denying the diff the, the the similarities between what they've shown you and what happened and they already pulled off the ufo one at the 1984 olympics in los angeles when the closing ceremony a spaceship flew in across los Angeles over the stadium and landed and this gigantic gray alien came out and goes we approve of this meeting of people and coming together for sport it's a you can't believe it when you're seeing the thing now, and uh, you know Ronald Reagan was in the in in the crowd and everything, and he was the one who made the famous speech. What if there was an invasion? Wouldn't that suddenly end all our differences? You know this kind of thing. For almost one hundred years, you have celebrated the best that humanity has to offer. You call it the Olympic Games, and for that. And for the cities which have kept the Olympic ideal alive, I salute you. And uh, so the Olympics, you know, is, is 
you know, someone, a friend of mine called it, it's a knockout for Freemasons, but that's actually what it is. That's actually what it is. It's just a big opportunity to tell the people, the masses, what they're going to do because I think they have to don't they have to do that they have to tell you what's coming up. Yeah, and then you wonder about this John. Well, you know, but we've already been given, like you said, the prophets and the seers, the John Wyndham's, the Philip K. Dick, uh, the H.P. Lovecraft. They've already given us what's coming in allegorical form. And lots of movies as well, and doc, even Doctor Who episodes, even things like you know Terry Nation uh, uh, stories for Doctor Who, they've shown us the 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 way out. You know the, what they thought they were writing down a story of like here's how you survive. Twenty eight days later, when I found out that twenty eight days later was the, based on this original version of Day of the Triffids, that was like wasn't that the same thing? Like London, they get trapped in Killian Murphy and his girlfriend trying to find a way out shoot you know out of london i mean it was that was that and they end up in scotland that was much more closer to the book except they went to scotland instead of the isle of white and then society begins again and that's what isn't that the great reset they all talk about they all talk about you know a cleaning of the slate and then we begin with the great reset you know people don't yeah, because... how they're, they're not lying to them they're telling them the truth and the great reset is them killing them and then reading the books like we've read the books gives us the tools. Okay, um, maybe 10, 20 years ago, you might not have realised you had the tools in your head to survive this. But they're certainly there when the time came and we knew what to do and we knew what not to do and what to believe and what not to believe. And Because I've often think back over the last three years and I think, how on earth did I not fall for a single thing of that? And I still don't understand sometimes how I didn't fall for any of it but then I think again about the conversations we have and the films that we've watched and the books that we've watched and all the things from the past and I think no because I've been primed I've already been I was groomed not to fall for this I think everything in my past um via entertainment and movies and music and art everything has all been leading up to this point. You know, today is World Goth Day, and I have this very strong memory of standing in Bayside train station all dressed in black uh, uh, and my hair blue, dark blue, and just sitting there and minding my own business. And this train pulled on the other platform and the entire train full of normies looking at me and going, <laughs> laughing at me like this and like like staring at me like I was an alien and I was quite tame looking compared to many other people that were in that scene back then but like staring the, the suburban normies pointing and staring at me and that reminds me so much of like well that train went in the distance how many of them are now su suddenly and unexpectedly you know it, it was almost like it was a, that was a metaphor in my life as the train pulled away it was like I was like People, I remember thinking to myself, people are so stupid, really. This, this is what this is what really shocks them, me dressed like this. But it was really, again, that, that you know what it was, Sarah? In the olden days, people told their their kid, their children's fairy tales, like the Brutus Grimm's fairy tale. And they're all warnings. You know, Little Red Riding Hood is about uh, menstruation and the dangers of being raped. Hansel and Gretel is pedophilia. And they couldn't tell people directly because they they told them in fairy tales. And these fairy tales sunk deeper into their subconscious. Well, the stuff that we grew up, the hauntology we grew up on, that was our fairy tale software in our minds. When the time would come when we'd need to be like this, Operation, you know, all those Doctor Who episodes we watched, all those Blake Sevens, all those Hammer films, all the Lovecraft books, all the sci-fi films, bump, it switched on in our brain in a just when it was supposed to as a survival mechanism the the psyche like the psyche like nature always finds an equilibrium it goes to show you that on some non chronological level psyche is aware of what's coming and it wants to work with us and so it targets our subconscious mind 
by using art, by inspiring as the muse artists and writers and filmmakers to provide us with these adult fairy tales that when the challenge arises, we subconsciously know. What what worries me is what have the kids of today got? Well, I didn't hear what, what, you said. what hauntology will the kids of today have to look back on or to save save themselves within the future? I don't see anything. I don't see anything of any substance. I, it's funny you said that. I mean, we're going off topic here, but uh, I found the other day a car for a, 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 a car from when I was a kid. And it's a little matchbox kind of sci-fi car, right? It was from a clip. And I was looking at that and I says, and I was just thinking to myself, while I was waiting for somebody, I went into the big, we have a, our own big Toys R Us type chain here. And I went to the retail part to get something else for the for the cats. And so I said to myself, I wonder what kind of toys kids are into today. Like, do they have the things we did? And it's bizarre. It's like, Lego doesn't teach you to be creative. It teaches you to build something that exists. Like uh, It's like a jigsaw puzzle. It's not like something where you, you sit down and begin and create through your mind. And uh, there was, uh, like, I was looking at the superhero. There was no such straightforward superhero figure, action figure. They all were these things with huge heads. Every distorted features, my, the Minecraft blockhead things. And nothing that was in that, even the toy cars were fantasy they just look weird or brightly colored. It's like the, the what there's no basis in reality. And then you tie that up with the, you know, there was nothing real in that store that a kid could like look to. It was nothing. It was all the, the stuff we had grown up in distorted into weird shapes and weird, weird things, you know, the kind of thing like Batman's with huge heads and things like that. And, and then I was thinking, well, then you see all the Marvel films and they're full of all these woke things. You know, Marvel comics were the better comics than DC when I was growing up because they had grittier characters. They were, they were more like, you know, it, DC comics were more like the American heroes. But Marvel, they were tortured souls. They were deep thinkers, you know, that were involved in challenging personal situations. And, and then you look at what, it's all woke, it's all... You know, the the last Marvel, few Marvel films I watched were atrocious. You couldn't watch them. They were garbage, you know, and it's not because of my age. And and you realize that they're, it's basically a world of slop for kids today. You know, there's no, it's a world of slop. That's the way I would put it. You know, uh, it has no definition. So therefore, it's not presenting a definition that they can call upon in the future. We saw alien films about space things coming in, attacking. Here's what you do to survive. Here's how you fight. Here's how you think a way out. And that was in every sci-fi movie, every science fiction, horror story, Devil Rides Out last week. Uh, that's all the films we've done, uh, all the books we've read, you know, this kind of thing. And and often the stuff we liked, didn't, like the John Wyndham novels, didn't have a happy ending. But they were almost, but they were, they were toolkits for survival, toolkits for understanding. But now... It's just a big blob of nothingness, and it provides it. It it, it prov it's like it, I think it all began with Teletubbies. I think Teletubbies, those kids who were born watching ah, da, da, and all that, they they they're, they're spending their whole lives like that. And you see that with the you look at these fellows, you think they're women. And look, I saw I'm I'm such a cute girl now, and it's a guy who looks awful in a dress. Well, that comes directly from La La and his handbag. You know. The, the ones who are raised, the Teletubbies is almost like a mind, a, a psychological mind weapon. And it's bearing fruits now. Hopeless adults who live in a fantasy world and don't know why they're there and don't know what they're, and they're not learning anything from it. Where our, sorry, where our generation were the end of that cycle that begin with the, with the fairy tales. I think our generation is definitely the crossover the crossover that's causing problems for what they want to bring in. Yeah, and you know how quick, how quickly it happened. You compare like uh, John Pertwee and uh, what's his name? The famous Doctor Who, the guy with the, the scarf. Uh, uh, Tom Baker. Tom Baker's Doctor Who to the ones that came later. They're very dark characters. The ones later are like, you, see, you know, that Scottish guy who was like a 
a clown and all this stuff. You know, it, it, it very quickly it changed into something fluffy overnight. Yes, I think the last decent dark doctor was one of the McGann brothers, he, but he only played him for a little while. Yeah. Uh, and then after that, it was the Scottish, I forget his name, the Scottish one. He was quite nerdy. Yeah, but he was the... Clumsy. Yeah. And then they went, they took that off in all woke directions as well. Remember that? Uh, yeah. And the, the, and the one, that, even when there was a dark thing, again, the, the, the resolutions were strange. They, they were, it was not the same writers that wrote the ones like Terry Nation and the earlier writers that had, there was a, you know, I can remember being terrified by the sea devils. I mean, the, the Daleks, there was nothing more terrifying than the Daleks, you know, to me when I was a little kid. They were brutal. They were like, you know, they were brutal. But that was especially a when they took the thing off. The first time they took the the lid off, and you yeah. saw that man, that bald head. Yeah, and that's and, and what do we see now? That's warning us about transhumanism. And yeah. you know, and Davros, the leader of the Daleks, that's Bill Gates, that's Fauci, that's Jeff Bezos, that's Elon Musk. This creature who's kept alive and given great power simply by technology. Otherwise, it's just a creature. And that's why we don't look up to these people and go, oh, look, Bill Gates is wonderful. You realize that he's Davros. You know, he's Davros. And you look at you look at uh, Hillary Clinton and that's Serverland from Blake 7. You know, this vicious, psychopathic, power-crazed woman that has, you know, no decency in her. And that warned us about this. And you remember what Blake 7, what he went to prison for originally? He went to prison for a, a trumped-up fake child molestation charge, which wasn't true. And that brings us right back to what you were saying about Childline. Yeah. And then again, that would have, and the ones you saw at Childline, many of them said, well, Blake, you know, in the back of their minds, someone said, well, Blake was stitched up. Blake was stitched up. And it was true. It was true. Okay, so that was the day of the trip. And boy, did that go all over the place tonight. But, you know, that's the beauty of this. this we're jamming tonight. We're jamming. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, Next week's film was suggested by Sarah. I've seen this one. I haven't seen this one since a little boy. It's the 1961 American film called The Haunting. So get watching that. You can find it online if you look hard enough, but I'm not telling you where. And now to one of the most important and popular parts of the show. What do you do about all this stuff to actually make you safer, to actually make you healthier? And to stop you from getting onto that ferry with Tom Cruise, it's Sarah with the Psychic Hygiene Report. It's fascinating how the past can seep into our present in unexpected ways. Have you ever walked through a place and felt like there was more to it than meets the eye? That's what we call a haunted landscape. It's not necessarily about ghostly apparitions or spooky phenomena, but rather the lingering presence of the past. Imagine strolling through an old, old town with centuries of history embedded in its streets, buildings and people's stories. You might sense a certain energy a feeling that the past is somehow still alive and influencing the present. It's like the whispers of bygone eras echoing through the sands of time. These haunted landscapes are like living museums with remnants and traces of what once was, and they might include forgotten structures or forgotten folk tales or even forgotten injustices, and they invite us to reflect on the layers of history that have shaped the world around us and the echoes that still resonate today. Sometimes these remnants can be unsettling because they remind us of unresolved histories, of conflicts and struggles that have yet to find any closure, and they challenge us to confront the shadows and acknowledge the complexities of our shared human experience. But haunted landscapes also offer an opportunity for introspection and growth. They invite us to delve deeper into our surroundings, to uncover hidden narratives and expand our understanding of the world in these quiet moments of reflection. 
where we can contemplate the lessons of the past and consider how they shape our present and future. So next time you find yourself in a place that feels haunted, take a moment to pause, observe and listen and allow yourself to connect with the spirits of the past, to learn from their stories and to gain a deeper appreciation for the rich tapestry of human existence. Because it's in these moments of reflection that we can nourish our psychic hygiene and foster a greater sense of connection with the natural world around us. Remember, the past is never truly gone. It lives on in the landscapes that we inhabit, waiting to be discovered, understood, and most importantly, respected. It's not so much a psychic hygiene suggestion this week, but more a way to connect with the natural world through the reflections of the past within our haunted hinterlands and landscapes. Thank you for that, Sarah. Yes, the term haunted landscape is a very misunderstood term. People think when they hear haunted, they think ghosts, but it's not. It's really, it's a landscape that haunts itself through its own past and its own present. I rem- you know, that's where, where the hauntological thing comes from. But I remember taking a train in the early 1990s, I think it was 1990 probably, from Philadelphia to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And it went through basically old Pennsylvania and would stop at these stations in the middle of nowhere where you would have a diner with a rusty old sign. And, you know, it, it, the, the, like in the middle of the, not, it'd be, I don't know what mountain range it would be, it'd probably be the Appalachians, but be in the middle of these mountains. And the train was slow and... The entire, and it was rained. It rained all the way from Philadelphia to, to Lancaster. And the whole journey felt haunted. The whole journey, the, every, to have that, I, I, I could feel the essence and the souls of all the people who lived in those towns all along the way and all the way back. And it was a very, it was a very powerful but amazing experience. You know, to come up to, to come to the and I, I couldn't remember there were there were like what they call whistle stops, basically a tiny station in the middle of nowhere, and uh, and Pennsylvania is a very long state, long state, and it kind of connects the Midwest with the East. So you saw these changes, but that was that was a a classic example of what going through a haunted landscape. I wasn't even in it; I was observing it from a train. And uh, yeah, I mean that's it. That's the whole experience. It's there to be savored. It's there to be drunk in. It's one of the things that makes you thankful you're not an NPC. It also is a great inspiration for creativity and writing, and um, even making videos. You know, you can so much. You can just draw so much from it. And even if you don't use it right now, it's it's there. Put it in the creative bank for another time. Yeah, I even just remember it. Make sure you remember you remember it well. And don't yeah. remember so much the sights and visual aspects, but remember the feeling. Remember the feeling it left with you. It is more of a feeling, isn't it? And I think that's how you remember the feeling that it gives you is what creates the images in your mind, which helps you create whatever piece of art or video or writing that you want to to bring in. And into if, it's a, if it's a big city, it happens at night. I notice if it's the countryside or small towns, it's during the day. I can remember I used to ride around the subways in New York late at night, going, "Oh, look, because you one once you're in the system, you you pay one fare and you go and go anywhere, and for one token, you can go all the way from the Bronx into the the darkest parts of Brooklyn." And I used to just ride the subway around like all night long, and just observe the difference. Sometimes it comes about a ground and it goes elevated, and you go through all these neighborhoods, and other times. You end up there, uh, just seeing all the different people that come on, and and you know look at them, and you, not staring at them, but you'd look at them in the corner of your eyes. You you wonder what his life story is, what her life story she's gone, and it was very powerful, very powerful, and you just drink it all in. It seems to be that cities it works better at night, and late at night when everyone's gone to bed, 
and not on like streets where there's clubs and you know things like that, but on the back streets and the empty streets. Even the suburbs I found can be like that. But uh, yeah. So yeah, thanks. Okay. Hauntology drinking in. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, hold on to your four-leaf clovers and grab your Enfield rain max, because whether it's raining cats and banshees or the sun is shining like a pot of gold, our favourite Irish weatherman has got you covered. It's Thomas with the Psychic Weather. I should have worn an Aaron sweater and a woolly cap for that intro. Yeah, the psychic weather, the psychic weather this week is well. It's, I'm still having those mad dreams that I spoke about the other week. They're still coming fast and furious. What they're about, I don't know. But red feeling has taken off again. I've seen some class, a, a textbook red fielding. I've seen uh, people just losing, losing it, and going waffling and and developing a strange behavior for nothing i saw one renfield who was renfield and complaining about renfield <laughs> so that's how renfieldy it is if there's such a word and i saw them in the shops today i saw them uh, on the road and uh, they don't know which road to torn down they're dry they drive erratically and yeah, and the, I went. I wanted to buy something in a shop, and no, it was at the till, and I did a cash register. And when I asked them, "Can you please take my money?" They looked at me like, and then they had an argument about which one was going to serve me and go. With the, it was just chaos. Like there was nothing making any sense. It was like that's. I think that's what the find the Renfield. The Renfield is uh, like what? What are you doing on this planet? You know, you're totally out of touch with reality. And then you're expecting everyone to get into contact with you, get into alignment with your dysfunctionality. And that's the psychic weather this week. Yeah, you need a Renfield umbrellas, your Renfield raincoats, but don't let it upset you too much. Just there's, an, there's also a lot of entertainment in the Renfields as well. But also, you know, we do know that the Renfields are setting off something to do with something else. So they're indicators, they're, they're the canaries in the coal mine of something else that might be going on. We watch. And we wait. Yes, the thing with the Renfields is don't engage with them. Don't feed them. Don't poke them. Just sit back and watch them because it's great entertainment, really. Yeah. It is. You, 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 don't, you don't adopt the, care, the canary in a coal mine as a pet because you, you find them at the bottom of the cage one day. <laughs> <laughs> with its toes in the air. <laughs> know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> As we continue this jam session, paranormal jam, I want to talk about an experience that I had when I was about 13, 14. And last week I was talking to Sarah that I don't really like camping anymore. And this played a part in it. South of Dublin and County Wicklow, there's a beautiful place called British Bay. It's it's kind of getting built up now. It's, it's becoming like a commuter area for Dublin. But back then, it was still a beautiful, pristine, golden beach with huge, gigantic sand dunes that was like 20 miles long. It was enormous. And at the end of it, there was some very hit. There was some hills and cliffs that jutted out to the sea. And I was on a camp, a scout trip, and we were camping out there in a, in a, in a field behind the beach. And it was all terribly exciting and everything. But all the kids in the scout troop were all afraid. They were all afraid of the place. They didn't like it. And they used to they, they used to be scared at night. And they, and many of them were not like scaredy cat kids. They didn't like it. But I didn't really notice them. And when my friend Kevin Tucker and I went for a walk along this, towards this cliff edge. And it just felt awful. And it should be beautiful. And it was the end of the beach where the cliffs jutted into the sea. And I felt this enormous presence around me. This presence that was almost like you were in the domain of somewhere you shouldn't want to be. And we walked to the edge of the cliff. 
and there was a bird's nest sitting on the edge of the cliff with blue eggs in it. And so I went down to take a closer look and I nearly fell into the sea. It was only grabbing onto some bushes that I, I, I missed them, you know, slipping into the, into the sea, but the rocks below. And I immediately was aware that, that was a trap. I had been trapped somehow. And then another day, we would walk on the beach one morning, real early, like five o'clock. It was, it was bright. And we saw a hare that was the size of a deer. It wasn't a deer. It was a hare. I know what a hare looks like. and I know what a deer looks like. The hare was the size of, a, was, was enormous, gigantic, the size of those huge kangaroos. And it was walking strangely along, along the sand dunes. And we both said, what is that? Look, it's a deer. And I, so then we realized that's not a deer, it's a hare. It's a gigantic hare. And then we left and went back home. And for years afterwards, it played on me what was down there, what was in that place. And I think I encountered some... Kind of, when I heard Dr. Ronald, Professor Ronald Hutton's story of encountering the Leanne and she when he was on holiday, I think down in Kerry, uh, when he's walking on the countryside late at night, and he felt this dreadful presence stalking him. And I said, my God, that's exactly how I felt, uh, that there was this at the place that was trying to trick me to my doom. And I think that that was, and you talk about a haunted landscape now, this place was full of it. It was almost like, it was one this peninsula, this this area that jutted out to the sea, and was where the Liam and she had lived, had made its home, and it possibly shape shifted into a hare, a giant hare. That's quite common in Ireland. The puka is known to shape shift into a giant rabbit, and um, I think I think I actually now looking back on it, I think I encountered the Liam and she. Now the Liam and she is a fairy that in a city is associated with the artist on a muse. It literally means the loving fairy. And the or, the, or the, or the lover of the barrows. And this landscape was like the barrows. It had that, it like, it had that barrows look to it, even though it was sand dunes. And when they don't live in the city and when they don't prey on an artist, they apparently live at the edge of the coastline in a kind of a demonic form. Now, I can remember this rabbit like it was yesterday, this hair like it was yesterday. And what I remember about it was that it's something not right with its back legs, its hind legs. It That's why it didn't walk or hop like a regular rabbit. Its back legs had something not right with them. They were not fully resolved or formed. So I was, I was seeing like a, an entity of some kind trying to look like a hare. And uh, that was, that was, that was, that, you know, it's, uh, that's what this thing is now, this part of the show I wanted to introduce with Sarah is an, a paranormal or strange event that happened in your past. And it wasn't until much later in your life that you resolved it and said, oh, maybe that's what it was. Now, I haven't been down to British Bay in years, and I don't know what that, uh, that area has been built up on. But funny enough, someone I'd mentioned on my Facebook wall today, and someone had mentioned I heard about I heard about that that fairy in that area. So it seems to be that I wasn't the only one who, who experienced that and knew it was there. I had no previous uh, knowledge about folklore of it existing. Uh, to me, or just on holiday at the beach in the countryside. Uh, but it was at the I, this, I can't describe the over the sense of being stalked, and just on around sand dunes, nothing. You know, it wasn't a sinister forest or anything like that, but there was something, it was like this thing was an entity, this thing was a dark fairy on the coast, and it had it could shape shift into a giant hare. And I, I, I'm now looking back on it, I know that's what I saw compared to that, that I read the descriptions of people who have experienced it in those type of environments. A deadly, dangerous fairy that when I can't use the muse to drain someone's life force will actually lead them to their debt. Wow. Wow. I've, uh, did it try to put you into the water? 
Oh, well, oh, it led me down with those blue eggs. And I remember the, the color of the eggs were fluorescent blue in the nest. And I was like, wow, look at those eggs. My friend said, I can't believe how blue they are. And so I went down for a closer look and slipped on the slippery grass. And it was only I grabbed onto things to stop me from falling into the sea. So it tried to fascinate you with the eggs. Big time. And, and, and lure me, you know, like, you know, those fish under the sea that have those lights in front of their mouth. The angler fish, like that. But the, the thing that sticks out is the hair. We thought we were seeing a deer. It was so big. I mean, this thing was colossal. And that was another, you know, it was when in that in its domain, we were transformed into a version of this reality that was very different than this reality. Like another another world in t- inside this world where the deer, where the where hairs grew to the size of deers. I don't know. But I always remember the back of the legs were crap. They were like, you wouldn't think, you know, they were like whatever it, it, it shape shifted or presented itself as, it hadn't done it completely. And the legs were like, you know, where hairs normally have these incredibly strong muscular legs at the back. This one's head, this hair's legs just looked like they were, the thing was deformed or something, but it walked perfectly fine. Like you couldn't see the end of the legs almost. It was like weird. That, so you might have gone into the fairy realm, into the she realm. Possibly, but it didn't feel any different. And what I do remember is there was a ship out at sea in the Irish Sea. And it, we were looking at it and it was still there when we saw the big hair and had that experience. So we didn't go into a different reality. It was almost like illusions were created around us in this reality. You know what I mean? Because the, the ship was there yeah. all the time. That begs the question, um, it tried to get you into the water. Is that because, is, is water sentient? Was the water hungry? And well, they, that happened to me years later in Maine at, at, a, at a lake, a pond in the woods. No, I think this thing was definitely trying to just harvesting my soul, harvesting my, you know, just killing it. These, these things hate humans. And, this was a particular nasty fairy who hates humans, and in whatever reason was sick of the sight of them in the in their, maybe it was some kind of, it was sick of them encroaching, because this area had stopped becoming rural and start becoming more, right. you know, people were starting to holiday in it, and caravans were going down there, and this would have been a place that would have been in the middle of nowhere a hundred years ago, maybe it was getting sick of humans encroaching upon its its domain. Right, yeah, so you were there and it, it thought it'd take it out on you. I often wonder how many people fell off that cliff. Like, I know a cliff around here that so many cars have driven off it. It's really weird, even competent drivers who were sober drawn off the cliff. And you wonder if it was, that was something like that as well, that they created an, an illusion where the road was straight and going into the sea, you know? Yeah, sounds like something out of a Stephen King novel, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, and and also, I often want you know those places where the the road the, the road goes uphill, and if you stop your car and take up your handbrake, it rolls uphill. I often wonder if that's part of that experience as well. There's nothing to explain that. There's nothing yeah. to explain that. I saw I saw an instance of that in a Father Ted episode. <laughs> yeah, they gone uh, the the everything rolled up the hill, and does that actually happen? Well, that's real. They exist all over the world. I They're, didn't know that. Didn't that's a know. real thing. That's a real phenomenon. They right. exist all over the hill, where we ta- all over the world. If you take a handbrake off your car, the car goes uphill, and nobody can explain it. And you try to say, "Well, maybe it's really going downhill," but I know an even weir- weirder place. There's a place called Four F O R E in County West Westmead, and there's a thing, a phenomenon called the Seven Wonders of Four, and there's a huge ancient abbey and castle there. The river flows uphill. I've seen it with my own eyes. The river, fl- the river flows uphill. The, the you're there. That's up here, and the water's going uphill, as clear as anything. I mean, I, I talk about haunted landscape. That the, the reality is can be you can find these weird things in everyday situations, and people come from all over Ireland to see this river flowing uphill. Is that I wonder? Is that the gravity that's an, is an anomaly with the gravity, or is that the water? 
Is the water alive? I don't know. It's just bizarre. And you're sitting there and you're looking. I only saw it a few months ago. And I said, come on, I'm going to really check it out now. I'm going to really give it a good look over. And the river is flowing uphill. I'm going to have to look into that because... Yeah. Look up the look up the roads where we the roads where cars stop. It's real, and this and rivers will flow uphill. It's like and that place that I was in British Bay kind of reminded me of somewhere where the normal rules of nature, in some aspects, are switched off, and another nature exists there. That's so strange. I had no idea. Like the only time I've ever come across it was was like I say in an episode of Father Ted when Father Jack's wheelchair started going up the hill yeah. and over the cliff. It went over the cliff. There's a few of those places in Ireland, yeah, and they're famous. You can stop your car and the car goes uphill. And some of the hills are quite severe. I, I have to have a look at that. That's fascinating. That have you? Yeah. Been, have you? Have you? Wow. And have you got any idea? They're in America. They're they're in they're, they're so sure, pretty sure there's a few in England. They're everywhere. No one can figure them out. It's That's like brilliant. the rules of the natural world stop at these places. I wonder if it's a liminal space between this world and another one. Yeah, it could be, but they don't feel any different. Like the the river at four. Now the place is kind of it's very, you know, the fact that it would even have these seven wonders, like there's a tree that a tree that never stops blooming. And there's a few of them. There's like all kinds of things that if you look it up the seven wonders of four, and one of them is the river that flows uphill. And uh, so that maybe the entire place of four is a is a liminal space of some kind. Could be a portal or something. Just yeah, but, you something know, we can't see. But a lot of people visit it, you know, like a lot of people go there to visit it. So it's not like it's a you have to experience at a certain time. I mean, I I was laughing at when I saw the river flowing uphill. I was, I was actually giggling and laughing at the the impossibility of it, and yet there it was. And I thought about everything. Is the land really going downhill severely, and then the river slightly up? So maybe that's no, no. The river was going up, and the water was going up the river uphill, and not like pooling. Like suppose you had like when a river. You know, otherwise the water always finds the easiest path to the ocean or whatever, right? So you say, okay, if there was an incline there like that, the water would pool around the bottom, maybe form to a, a lake or something or a rivulet that would go around the incline. No, it goes up the incline. Might be some sort of magnetism. I don't know. But then what? what what's magnetic about water, though? You know exactly. Yeah, nothing. Nothing. And it's flowing through the countryside and continues up the hill like it's no big deal. Some kind of pull. Well, it's going to be gravity, can't it? It must be gra- something to do with gravity. Speed. With the gravity, I've walked, and I was walking up along the part where it flows uphill, and I didn't feel anything different or see anything different. It was a normal, like, river flowing. Not a very big one, but like a, what would you call a brook kind of thing. Yeah, it was flowing uphill as clear as anything. And the car thing, I've never experienced it, but I've seen loads of TV documents about the cars that roll uphill. It's all, I think it's a famous one in Vermont or someone, a very famous one, but the cars go uphill. And it's been known about for years. And also, like, if you put a football on the road, it will roll uphill. So it's not metal. Must be some kind of gravitational pull. Or some, some kind of a, a vortex. vortex. Yeah. 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 Man. Like a natural vortex, like in the Earth, because the Earth does have them, various oh, places. We, well, we know that like gravity is not the same all over the world, and gravity is a very mysterious force. They don't really know what gravity is. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but they just don't know what really makes it happen. And they have theories around things like gravitons and stuff like that. But yeah, not mad. What? Um, I wonder if it's something to do with what causes a whirlpool, because isn't that a vortex, some kind of... But there's gravitational pull. Yeah, I know that, and I know what a whirlpool is like. You know, but this is just a this is just a fucking river pool. <laughs> I can't I can't explain it any other way. I'd love to see that. Wow, I'm gonna have to have a look and see if there's any YouTube videos about that. Yeah, the seven wonders of four. Seven yeah. wonders of four, like F O U F O R E, like in golfing four. Right. 
Well, I should it's have a look. Place and it's a, like it's definitely worth a visit. It's got a really cool castle and stuff there, but uh, ruins. But yeah, it's mad. And this is it's all this this is load the seven wonders of four, and there's all kinds of other anomalies that are in this little area of this like uh, townland. And it's been known about for centuries that people said this strange things happen here. And they still do. I mean, I saw my own eyes. The, the, the fact the river flows upstream is as clear as that anything. Wow. And yet nobody's, the scientists haven't tried to explain it. No, because they can't and they ridicule it. Or they say, yeah, it's, just... it's really flowing downhill, but it's an optical illusion. You think it's going up. No, you liar. Don't try to gaslight yeah. it. It's going uphill. Like the one of the famous roads, I think it's in Northern Ireland, where the car goes uphill. I'm not joking, the road's literally like that. And the car kind of takes the handbrake up and it starts going up like that. <laughs> That's really topsy turvy, yeah. that. Wow. Yeah. So reality is far more bizarre than people think. Yeah. So, so Speechless. I. I think I went this place in British Bay where I had that experience. I think reality was just wrong and that the eggs were too blue. The hairs were the size of a uh, uh, deer and it had my, um, bizarre legs. And this Leanne and she was stalking me all the way saying, I'm going to kill you if you don't live. I've never experienced anything. I've never seen anything physical manifest with regards to she or fae, fairies. But I was in Scotland in the Cairngorms, Cairn Cairn and uh, we'd gone walking and we'd walked for about four hours and we got to a beautiful part of the forest that was very thick and very dense forest and it looked like something out of Middle Earth. And we started to walk through. We'd gone all through the pine forests and we'd gone through into this, what looked like Middle Earth, and we'd only walk two minutes and the atmosphere changed immediately and it was thick and it was heavy and it was crackling and it was buzzing um but not in a nice way and it was almost like it stopped you and you thought I'm not supposed something doesn't want me here I need to go because if I keep if I go any further in here I'm not coming out that sounds kind of similar to what I had yeah but well, I didn't see anything yeah. And, you know, like talking about leading things that are doom, that that hill near where you live with the American bomber on the top, well, they have all kinds of gear and everything, even in fog, to know how high they are off the ground. And that thing slammed into the side of a hill. It makes you wonder if there's something on these hills also grab the planes when they're going by, you know, to get them, you know, like something like that. Because that happens a lot here. In World War Two, or that happened an awful lot here. Planes, you know, hitting into the, the side of mountains when they really shouldn't have. Some of the stories about that say that it actually um, fell out of the sky. Wow. And it, it, they were dead before they hit the floor because it hit something in the sky. Like it wasn't air. there. There was no air. Like when okay. ships, you know, ships sometimes just fall to the bottom of the ocean. And what yeah. happens is a like, methane gas rises from the ocean bed as a bubble, and methane gas does not provide the buoyancy of the oxygen and water does. So as soon as the methane gas is the bottom of the ship, the sh ship just falls to the bottom of the sea. That's how frightening is that, you know? Like a methane gas bubble. Like so it could have been something like that, the air wasn't underneath it and it just fell. Fell down. Oh yeah, some of the stories say that it saw the legendary Longendale lights, which we don't know what they are, but there's uh, lots of lights up there that have caused lots of problems for people. Some people say it could be it could be UFOs, it could be fairies, could be uh, will o' the wisps. I just be... had, I just had a memory, sorry, of you know I think it was unsolved mysteries. You know I'm Robert Stack, unsolved mysteries, back in the eighties, nineties, and there was a story on it about an American airline that fell like. 30,000 feet before they recovered it and the pilots were just fired just as, as you know as in disgrace and they said that uh, that they were there was a, there was shop talk about pilots on this particular aircraft by doing a certain thing they could get there faster or something or burn less fuel because there was kind of like a few weird fuel allowance thing but this thing was just going along and just went fell like we described that one and 
it, they reckon that it was like what you say, like a vortex, like there was no air on the needle, and the plane fell. And, and the, it, the guys only recovered like a few thousand feet off the ground and managed to get the control again. But the, it wasn't their fault, and they were fired over it. And it was just this weird anomaly. And the airlines kept it quiet because they didn't want people knowing that there are places in the sky where, you know, pit flight is impossible. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, a mystery what happened with that plane. I think it appeared in 14 times as well, that story about the American bomber. There was a, the, the valley in that area is called Bleaklow, the, the moor. It's been right. in the 14 Times magazine a couple of times over the... Over the years, yeah. yes, that is a very haunting place to go up there. There's no houses there, nothing, no lights, right? Nothing, just bogs. Lots so, of bogs. So that's my experience. I'm actually going to go down to that place at some point in the future to have a look, uh, just to see if it's still there, if something is still there. Or it's been all developed up and now, but that would be a ex prime example of a place that if they built housing around it, it would have the problems that you talk about about the build towns and the layer upon layer, where the initial haunt hall with the initial ex paranormal experience has the houses on it, they generate a new one and so on. Because that would be a, that would be a classic place for that to happen. Yes, I don't know about yourself, but if I ever moved house now. I'd be very, very dubious about moving. I would have to be 100% certain that the place felt all right. Not just the house, but the area. I would be looking at it with an extra set of eyes now if I was to move to live somewhere where they'd knock down a fairy tree. No. Or drive on a road junction where they knocked it down. Yeah, no way. Definitely not. I don't even like standing on the bluebells, to be honest. Have you ever seen that? that traffic camera where the dogs all run out and they know a car crash is coming. The dogs mm -hmm. are all playing in a yard and they run out. Every time they run out, a car crash happens. Like the dogs knew the car crash was coming. So it's mad. If you look online, you'll find it. And they're just, the dogs are playing and they suddenly run out to the road and they're looking at the road and the car crash happens. And then like, <laughs> the junction was probably built on somewhere like that. And the dogs are attuned to it. It's kind of funny, but it's, it's nasty as well. Because the car accidents happen, but it's really funny how the dogs run out. Wow, Where, where's that? I don't know. I just seen the video online. You can look for it. Dogs right. run out every time car crash happens. Yeah, knowing it. Yeah, it's mad, isn't it? it was caught on a CCTV. Yes, I just wanted to give you a few experiences of my own in in the house here, talking about haunted houses and places. Um. I don't live in a haunted house per se, but I have seen lots of lots of things here. Um, and one of them was a shadow person. I saw a shadow person, um, which is quite scary, actually. Probably one of the most scariest experiences I've had in the house. And I'd gone to bed. It was Christmas and I'd gone to bed and um, woken up about two o'clock in the morning. And, you know, you just lie there, you open your eyes in the darkness and think, oh, I'm awake and it was like a seven foot figure stood by the wardrobe um, that looked like the Grim Reaper had the the hood the cowl thing on and the, and the it was lent on um, is it a crook or a staff or something it was lent it had that in its hand and it wasn't looking at me it was looking ahead ahead it wasn't aware of me but it was so big about seven foot maybe eight foot taller than the wardrobe and um it was solid black and I lay there looked at it and I thought am I dreaming wake up wait and I tried to you know wake myself up properly I wasn't dreaming I was wide awake so I looked at it 10 seconds or so it didn't disappear and I thought no that 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 thing's there so um, I shot up, put the light on, and it just evaporated. Did it have any detectable kind of clothes that you could recognise? Did it have a cloak or a hat or anything? It had um, a cloak and a cowl. So it was the typical Grim Reaper, what you see on the depictions that you see. Um, 
And silly me, then, wide away, it goes on the internet then, having a look for shadow people and Grim Reaper-looking things turning up in the bedroom. And I read all kinds of terrible, terrible stories, which frightened me even more. I shouldn't have done that. It's like I looking in the medical had, thing, had, you know. Did you discover that other people had seen the Grim Reaper? Yes, other people had. And then they, they were telling stories about people, you know, people that they knew who'd passed away not long afterwards. So that frightened me. Um, so never do that. It's like looking in the medical dictionary. Just don't do it. Yeah, yeah. So I, 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 I have a toothache. They look on the med, look. They go to the online websites, and then they think they have like AIDS or something by five minutes. Yeah. Later. yeah. But anyway, thankfully nobody died, so it was nothing. It wasn't a harbinger of anything like that. Well, but that... I was, I was frightened. I didn't want it to look at me because I knew if it looked at me, I would have seen the glowing eyes. Well, when you said it was jet black and solid, it almost sounds like it's the void, a void in reality. When you do certain magic rituals, sometimes if you do it properly, the world around you starts to the vanishing. It goes all black at the edges. It's literally you're, you're destroying the reality that you're in. And I, I, when you said jet black, it's almost like it's a void and it's the abyss in the shape of in a in an, an anthropomorphic shape. Right, that's interesting. I had what made me think I was dreaming. I wasn't dreaming, but when you first wake up, you think, "Am I dreaming?" I had been doing tarot card the night before, and the death card had had come up. I was doing something with the death card, and I wondered, "Am I dreaming? Is it because I've done something with the death card? Is it on my mind?" And as I lay there. And I thought, come on, Sarah, wake up, come out of it, wake up. And I thought, I'm wide awake, it's not moving, it's still there. And I I, I almost reached out to see if I could touch it, but I didn't have the didn't have the courage. So I just put the light on. Um 30 seconds worth of time. This that's quite a long time when Did you have sleep paralysis? No. Mm. no. I spoke about that, that before about that guy who was playing the video games online. And he was doing it on, he was talking to the guys he was playing the game with. And he, he turned the light off and behind him was this solid, dark, black, human-shaped shape. And then he quickly shut the light on because he'd seen it. And how I know it was real was his behavior. He went... He put the light back on and didn't talk about it with the guys he was playing online with because but the other guys online recorded the video and that's how we know about it because he, he you know he saw something that freaked him out but he didn't make it and that's a very plausible reaction he didn't a woman would scream i'm sounding sexist now but a fella wouldn't especially a guy who was trying to impress other people and he would just kind of like um switch the light back on and get back to the sub subject but the other guys didn't see it until they were looking at the video back later on. And one of them saw it. But he saw the thing in his monitor from the camera. He shut the light back on. And like you said, boom, it was gone. It was like, the you know, but he, his reaction was so plausible. He went, and then, okay, let's do this. And you could see that it was, what the hell was that was going on in his mind for a second? Yes, it's similar to me. I thought, what what the hell's that? And when I realized then I wasn't asleep, I wasn't asleep. It was actually wide awake. It was there, wasn't moving, put the light on, and it just disappeared, dissipated. And it was only then that the shock come in then. And that's when I got upset then because I didn't like that. Didn't like that at all. Um, got a bit upset because it was shock, really. Never seen it since. Um, but even now, where I saw it, I um, don't like that area of the room where I saw it. And I do tend to smudge there quite a bit now. Like, like it's coarse now or something. Just like maybe it's there and I can't see it. You know, to me, maybe it's sharing the same space. And that's where, that's the doorway where that is, the, the portal. So I do tend to... I've put the washing basket there <laughs> and um, I tend to smudge around there a bit. I want to get back now. You're writing me something to the landscape things again. 
we talked about a haunted landscape, right? What that really means in the kind of like the, 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 the literal sense, not the literal sense, but the allegorical sense. Then there's the idea of the coarse landscape. You know, what you call the H.P. Lovecraft always writes about the coarse landscape, kind of like the hills above Arkham, where the animals don't look right, the people don't look right. I've had those experiences where I've gone into towns and locations where the cats and dogs walk in the street didn't look right. And the whole place felt like, get the hell out of here, ASAP. Have you ever had that experience? That's a weird one. It happened to me in Tennessee once uh, in like some rural village town in the middle of nowhere. And everybody looked wrong. Every, everything looked wrong. And it wasn't a hauntological experience, but it was a, it was this is a like a forbidden land, a cursed landscape. Right, no, I've not nothing comes to mind on that. No, yeah, it's gonna be the weirdest thing. It's like the way Tolkien talks about the 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 barrows, the, the you know the the dead barrows and the parts of the countryside, Middle Earth, where it's just like full of debt, and it's not obvious. It's a uh, it's connected to the structures in the in the area. Oh, I've had that a few times. I've had it here. And I can tell you a story. I have some friends in Dublin who I do come up here to visit now and again. And they were telling me that during the height of the lockdown, the, lock, the lockdown seemed to have charged a lot of 40 and kind of stuff. And they, 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 they were ignoring the, when the lockdown restrictions are broke on distance, they started going for drives in the countryside. And they told me, and these are two very straight up people. They're not like, you know, just, that they came to this town in the countryside that looked like it was the 1930s. And it was a, there was no one in it. And they drove through a town. And, all, and they said, I've never seen this place before. Where is this? And there was no one in it. And, and, and it just looked, there was no modern signs in the shop windows. There was no modern street lights or traffic signals or road signs. It just looked like the 1930s or something. And then they said, oh, it must be a movie set. Maybe it's a movie set. They're making a movie. And then they drove to the next town and they said, they went to a restaurant and they said to the someone that was working there, what's the name of that town back there? Is that is it, is it a movie set or something? And they said, there's no town back there. It doesn't exist. And they, they could describe it, the church and everything. And the guy's, no, there's no, that does, that's not there. You can't, you must be came in a different road. Uh, and I think that they went into a time war for something. And they both, they were very nice people, but they were very sensitive people. And I could tell they both took the lockdown and everything very badly. It affected them very deeply. And I can remember reading a Colin, or actually Colin Wilson was on Red Ice years ago, about 13 years ago before he died. And he described an experience he had where he was driving in the snow coming back from a cottage in the countryside on a single lane country road and on either side was a ditch so if he had have gone off the road into the ditch either side he was doomed, he was finished no one could come and get him, big heavy snow drifts he wouldn't have been able to get out he was screwed and it was all, literally only the, the heating in the car keeping him alive and he said he was so concentrating on the white knuckles of holding the steering wheel and not going off either side, that the countryside around him started to change and look all strange colours and everything because of the sheer intensity he put into making sure he didn't skid off the road and, the, and knowing what it would mean if he did. And I think that's what happened to these people. I think that they, um, they saw another town in another reality in a different time uh, because they were so, they were, and I know another kind of people they are. They're very, they're very sensitive people, uh, and they, 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 they were so upset about the whole lockdown and everything, and they fell out with their families and everything. It was that kind of situation, and I, and one of them had a seafood restaurant that was like a, a well-known chef, a successful chef, and had to lose that because of the whole thing. So I think that they generated a. A super consciousness reality, or got into a different time loop, and ended up back in the thirties. That's that. 
so so they they manifested it kind of thing through the psychic energy yeah through yeah. their own psychic their energy own, their own psychic state dropped them through a time loop i think and 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 they describe it to me and they can't get their heads around it it's so difficult for them to even tell me about like how they experienced it and i said i think you went through an altered reality and she goes it's the only thing that explains it because that town didn't exist and it was so it looked like the 1920s or 30s so i, I so have you ever i, I think there's all oh, those layers upon those worlds upon worlds upon worlds that there are towns and other places you may be sitting in the, your living room right now, maybe in the middle of a big huge city or in the middle of a forest in another reality that's over. It. And I often wonder when we dream, do we sometimes go into these realities around us that are outside this frequency we perceive in? Well, it's funny you should say that because um, I'd woken up one evening, one night and in the, a far corner of my bedroom on top of this is going to sound crazy but on top of the wardrobe there were a load of victorian nurses in a hospital getting on with their business and i'm sat there watching it like watching a movie when did this happen oh this was um the last couple of years last i don't know exactly last couple of years so it was during the whole rona thing and all that yes and i, I watched and, I, and i'm looking and i'm thinking What's going on up there? And I'm and I'm watching it, and it wasn't scary. I was actually watching. There was nurses that you know, like um, I can only describe. I'm saying Victorian, but I'm. Uh, do you remember the Carry On nurses from the Carry On films? Yeah, yeah the hat. They had the the hat with the big with the red cross on the front. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that. Oh, very all the time nurses. Yeah, and they were getting on. They weren't aware of me, and I don't know what they were doing up there, but they were, they they were there. They weren't at ground level. They were on top of the wardrobe. I wonder how many people who still think they're seeing ghosts are actually seeing other realities pouring through. I I believe that that's true. I do. Yeah. Just like um, the radio stations, you know, if you tune into Radio 1, doesn't mean Radio 2's not there. Yeah. still there on the airwaves. You just... The same same space, different frequency. It's a shame you can't do something to make a switch over. You know, if you could actually do it, I mean, maybe you should. We're not supposed to do it for lots of reasons. But to if you could, if you could actually scientifically prove it, maybe it has been scientifically proved somewhere. They just haven't told us about. It. Yeah, but would you want to? If it was scientifically proven, and every N, N, every NPC then decided to. They give their opinion and thoughts on that. It just spoil the magic of it. I think. Take it's the like, magic it's out like of it. The, it's like the UFO thing at the beginning. We've come full circle in the show. That if you can actually hand it to an NPC and a normie, they take the magic out of it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the best thing about this this Fortean world is the magic of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's an escape from. Um, to the um day to day drudgery, five sensory world, yes, but also it, it's yeah, I agree. That's really all I can say about that. You're right. You're bang on the money, and right. it's, the UFO thing has no interest to me anymore because the alien stuff. Because the normies all believe in it. Maybe the normies not believing it is what gives it its potency. And and maybe that kind of thing only shows itself to yeah. and minded people. Yeah. That it, maybe maybe other worlds or the frequencies give you a glimpse as a gift to keep you on the right path. And that's where synchronicities and things like that come from. Yeah, the universe giving you a nod and a wink and saying you're on the right path is a little glimpse of yeah. how it really is. But I'm not going to give you too much. Can't give too much away because you're not really supposed to know. Or you know, you know, if, or if you knew too much about it, you wouldn't be able to function in this world, would you? No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. still got to function in this world. Yeah, you have to compress your consciousness into the now. Yeah. 
But that's why I try to spend as much as little time in the real social norms as I possibly can. Oh, so I can come back to this world. Yeah, it's bad for you. It's bad for you. It's, I find it's actually the real world is actually dangerous for your your mental health and everything. It's better to like uh, live in a parallel existence or something. Yeah. I just go over there when I have to and get yeah. in, get out. Yeah, because look at the effect it had on a couple who were so upset and damaged by the lockdown that they actually had an experience like that. And in normally, well, I was just trying to say to them, it's a gift, isn't it? It's a gift. You've been shown something as a gift. That yeah. it's the same, the same fortitude and tenacity that made you resist the needle craft and see through this pandemic and everything and deal with family members falling out with them and all that. It's the same thing that's given you the gift to see these these um, sh- shifts in reality. You know, and, and, I, and I think these gifts are given like yeah. that, these little glimpses, because to people who are in line with natural law. Yeah, it's kind of initiatory element of it. It's yeah. like, like you know, that's why you know you hear people like Brian Cox. I'm not going to do it, and people talk about their experiences of life, and I go. Well, I listen to myself, my experience of life is nothing like what you're telling us life is about. Nothing at all. Dawkins and people like that. Well, wow, well, I don't experience life like that. So it's like there you go. Like they're they're almost they're they're almost like switched off or something on purpose. It's almost like the deliberately switched off on purpose. Yeah, it's, and it's almost like the universe or whatever you want to call it. Um I, I, ancestors spirit whatever are giving you a little glimpse of something because the people who are in tune and respecting the natural law is what's needed otherwise this world's going to i don't know hell in a handbasket if you like for want of a better word yeah anton levey who wrote the the satanic bible had a very interesting theory once he kind of blocked out a lot of the paranormal stuff because he said it interfered with his day-to-day living and correct thinking, uh, his rational stuff, but he didn't discount it. And towards the end of his life, he spoke about an experience he had where there were these bats or these old swimming pools in San Francisco where he said he saw there was always rumors of monsters living in them, these aquatic monsters living in them that were some kind of reptilian thing. And he saw them and described them as Lovecraftian creatures. And it was only the confirmation of other people seeing them that made him realize that there was more to reality than just, you know, the, the, the here and now, that kind of satanic mindset. And funny enough, I was thinking about that the other day. And I said, I wish I'd get more information on his on LeVay's stories about all the stuff. And then a newspaper clipping appears of these reptilian subterranean creatures spotted around California from the night from the same period, the 1950s. And it was like the universe was saying, keep looking, keep looking, you're looking the right, you're looking in the right direction. So ironically, although I wasn't trying to I wasn't being confronting a satanic thing. The same dilemma that caused him to question his reality was the same thing was happening to me at that moment in time. I was like, reptilian lizard creatures, a subocratic creatures on the California. And there you go. And then it pops up as a news story in a newspaper about these beings that had been seen on the ground. You know, so there you go. It's in real time. The data was the feedback happened. Right. Wow. Mm-hmm. I want to explore this more for a future Hocus Focus topic. Yeah, I'm trying to get uh, info on this as possible. But people in San Francisco and LA and other California cities have experiences with subterranean Lovecraftian lizard like creatures. And it was they- quite well known. And in San Francisco, it was very well known that these bats, this old bathing area that had been closed down. Are these things walking on two legs, or are they walking on four I've, legs? I've, I've only peered, I've only opened the door into the subject now. It's very interesting, yeah, to look into that. It's very interesting. Yeah, so the, so the, the way things bounce from one thing to the other is that's what makes it so much fun. 
if that one thing opens up to another, it's like if the pan not Pandora's box, but the those Russian nested dolls. It's like that, you know. Not to start again. So you... Okay, now we come to the book section of the show, the show and tell of the books that inspired us that should be in your fortean chronological collection, folklore collection, magic collection, whatever. And my book this week is one that is greatly been loved by me. And it's Peter Berifus Ellis's Celtic Myths and Legends. You can see, look at all the post-its and the annotations and that from over the years. Uh, putting it and, but I love this one because it's full of just wonderful tellings of Celtic stories. And it's not just Ireland. It's the Isle of Man. It's Cornwall. It's Brittany. It's it's Scotland and Wales, and it's great. And it's 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 a great go before you go to sleep reading a legend kind of book, written very beautifully. And this book is everywhere. I can guarantee you'd walk into your local decent neighborhood bookshop and it's for sale. And uh, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's 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 it always seems to come out every. It's called the Mammoth Book, so it's like that. But it's based that, but full of stories. And they're the kind of they're, they're they're written in a kind of a way that you, you they make you think about other things. Hence all my my notations and annotations on them from over the years. I'd say, oh, that reminds me of this. That reminds me of that. And I I do and I, and I would do that. And th and this this comes out. So Peter Berif Berifus Ellis E L L I S Celt the Mammoth Book of Celtic Myth and Legends. Own it, love it, enjoy it. That looks great. What's his name? Ellis. His middle name is B E R R E S F R O D. Peter Beresford Ellis E L L I S. Right. That looks that I'm going to have a look at that. I usually I usually jump on to the second hand book stalls before it goes live next week so I'll get, before everybody else starts to grab it. Has yeah. it got any illustrations in there? No, but the, no, the, the, it's no, they're just stories. And funny, it could be an ideal one to illustrate, you know. But no, it's just straightforward telling of the stories. Anything on the cover of like a kind. But okay, my book review this week is from the Tascan Icon series, and its spotlight is on HR Giga. You see that. And it's a really good tribute to the life and um, artistic legendary of the artist H.R. Giga. And this book provides a visually stunning exploration of Giga's unique and captivating work with a look into the dark and fantastical realms of his imagination. And from the minute you open the book, you're immediately drawn into his hauntingly beautiful and macabre universe. And these pages are filled with absolutely breathtaking images which showcases iconic biomechanical creatures and intricate landscapes and environments and the intention to detail is just out of this world i'm going to show you a few bits from it but i have to be very very careful because uh, some of them are a bit graphic and explicit and i don't want the channel getting into into trouble but it's absolutely Full. full of imagery like I say there that's the microphone um, that he designed for the group Corn yep. it's all in there um, all from his, his early works to all to his most famous creation which was the iconic alien design for Ridley Scott's film and the microphone there for Jonathan Davis of Corn. And it provides insights into his um, artistic influences and the themes that got run through his art. And the layout of the book um, allows the artwork to shine. And each image in the book is reproduced to a really high standard uh, to, to kind of reflect Giga's original creations. And it's really high quality printing and attention to detail. And the book's high quality printing and attention to detail do justice to the intricate nature of Giga's work. And it also includes essays and interviews with Giga, which looks at the context and personal insights into his life and his artistic philosophy. 
So whether you're a longtime fan of Giga's work or if you're new to his art, this book's a great addition for the bookshelf and a must-have for anyone interested in exploring the dark and captive realms of Giga's imagination. And it's a mesmerising journey into the mind of an artistic genius. Oh, Giger, Giger, how you pronounce his name, was a genius. There's no doubt about that. Uh, the book, and I'm, not only I'm a big fan of his artwork, but I'm also a big fan of Tashin books. Uh, Tashin books are tremendous value. Can, can, what you get for them, they're always really inexpensive, and uh, they're, they're like you, you get this an amazing book on whatever the subject is for nothing. Yeah, the pe- they they they're not expensive at all, and you can overlook them, you know, because they're that they're that cheap. You think, oh, are they going to be any good? Yeah. But they are. They are. Absolute and uh, um, he also did a Necronomicon. Don't remember that. There's the Geiger's Necronomicon. Yeah, fantastic. He was amazing. And the way he painted those things using pieces of machines as, as masks and stuff like that, when he used airbrushes, it, it is, he invented whole new ways of masking and painting, you, you know, using a piece of industrial equipment as a mask. So the paint shines. And he'd do it on the, on the spur of the moment, like, he was a magician. He really was, and I, I am... and, and even though the, you say it's dark, but there's even the darkest stuff has an incredible beauty about it. I can't explain it. The tonal quality. I was lucky enough to go to the Giga Museum in Switzerland, and that was an experience to walk around there and to go into the cafe, which was next door, because it was in the town where he lived and he was alive when. When I went and we went into the cafe and all the chairs in the cafe were like the alien um, chairs in the movie. And he was rumoured, it was said that he used to go in there for a coffee and we hung around all weekend, but we didn't see him. (laughs) But yeah, he just used to walk through the town. the 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 man was a genius, no doubt about it. Yeah, uh, and yeah. the the art is not ugly. The art is the artwork is dark, but it's beautiful. A perfect book for World Gothic Day, I might add. <clears throat> yeah. Absolute whoops! There, brilliant. Yep, and the symbolism is incredible. Another occult, in my opinion. Oh, he was. There was some stuff. Definitely, the fact that he did the Necronomicon and stuff. There was something definitely going on there. Definitely. But not oh. Luminati. Luminati, yeah. Or Luminati. Or... Right. Do you want me... Thank you so much for joining us tonight, you amazing bunch of 40ians. We can't express enough gratitude for all the love, support, likes and shares and positive vibes that you've showered upon us and our individual channels. Seriously, you guys rock. A special shout out to everyone who participated in the live chat last week. It was an absolute blast seeing all of you dive into the 40 and rabbit hole together, exchanging ideas, theories, and just having a grand old time. And we hope those connections continue to flourish and grow into fantastic friendships. You guys are the heart and soul of this community. So here's a big virtual hug and a heartfelt thank you for being part of this 40 and tribe. Please spread the word far and wide. Tell your friends, your family, your neighbours, and even that quirky conspiracy-loving cousin of yours. And let's keep this 40 and party going strong. Next week, we have another mind-boggling episode. And trust us, you won't want to miss that. So stay curious, stay weird, and remember that the truth is out there waiting to be uncovered. That was very eloquent. Thank you for that. I'm actually that was quite beautiful. Yeah, I echo all that. Thanks very much, you know. And uh, I should put on the Peter Murphy voice for the world gothic thing. Virgin Mary was tired. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, uh, Thanks again. Subscribe. All the best. And uh what's the what's the tarot card today, Sarah? Tarot of the week this week is the magician. I think we've had him before, but he's popped up again. And a magician is a card of tremendous potential and personal power, and it represents the realization of your abilities and the mastery of your chosen endeavors. And the figure on the card stands before a table 
which is decorated with symbols representing the four elements of earth, air, fire and water. And these elements signify the diverse aspects of life and the different forces that are at your disposal. And the magician's raised wand points to the heavens, symbolising the connection between the spiritual and material realms. And it suggests that you possess the ability to bridge the gap between the divine and the earthly, between the dreams and reality. And this card indicates that you have the power to manifest your desires and bring your visions to life through focused intention and willpower. And he's reaching up into the field of potential, bringing his ideas down into the physical, into manifest through direct action, as above, so below. The magician has all the minor arcana symbols on the table and it signifies that the resources, tools and opportunities that you need to fulfill an idea are within your reach. And it's a reminder that you possess the skills and knowledge necessary to make things happen. Trust in your abilities and have faith in your own potential. Furthermore, the magician card serves as a call to action. Remember last week's card, the Knight of Cups, bringing in creative ideas. Well, the magician is reminding you that thoughts require action and he encourages you to take charge of your circumstances and actively pursue your aspirations. However, it's essential to approach the magician with caution. The card warns against misuse or manipulation of power. Stay grounded ethical and aligned with your highest principles and remember that truth ma truth and mastery comes not only from wielding power but also from using it responsibly and for the greater good i always like jung's description of that that the infant ego had now has all the faculties necessary and it's transcended the parents the the emperor the empress and the high priestess and has now transformed into the stepped into consciousness person who now has all the faculties to step forward and go on the male journey of the first part of the major arcana up as far as the the, you know, the, the clock striking midnight but yeah uh, that's a great card a great card for getting stuff together to build things it's a great constructive card it's 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 and it's a great card for the imagination being brought into manifestation and it's a great card for starting a new project as well. Uh, but have, when you have all this, all the bits and pieces you need, you know, I always think of a band and you have like, the, you know, the cups, wands, swords and coins. So you have a band, you have the singer, the drummer, the bass player and the guitarist. You have your band. Now you can start rehearsing. And that's the that's the magician card to me. Good night, everybody. Stay spooky and see you next week. Good night.